Height work. Why? Well, good Lord never put my, me on this earth to earn money for the bloody paper. There must be something better in it than that. Don't you think so? Do you think he put you on this earth to walk around next stupid little camera, pointing at people? Eh? What would you like to have done instead? Well, basically, you've got to have money to do it here, do you? No, I've never found a lot of people talk about they find they find job satisfaction, they fit into a niche, but I never have. I spent days with Derek Perkins in that porter cabin selling tickets at the Angel Islington Tube. It was 1989 when I made that film, Heart of the Angel. It was a totally different media landscape then, and there was nothing like the amount of real people on screen as there are now. And it occurred to me so much has happened in documentary and in the portrayal of real people on screen that when Jessica approached me to make this Radio 4 programme with her, I was really interested in taking part. I wanted to look at documentary from the initial idea to the finished product and ask if the concept of truth is a problem. There are so many different ways of making documentary, but I wanted us to hear from someone who told story through character. One thing we should say from the start is that I make films in a very particular way. It is not the only way, it's not the best way, it's just the way I do it. So I am filming, I'm asking questions from behind the camera, I work with a sound recordist, I generate untold hours of footage and then have hell in a cutting room. The title The Camera Never Lies is just obviously provocative because the camera doesn't lie, but from the minute you've pointed at it and you've selected, you are being economical with the truth. You are selecting. You're not lying, but you're definitely telling a subjective truth. We're making an Archive on Four programme, Molly, so I'm going to play you clips that help tell our story along the way. Now, I had the idea for this programme reading about Nanook of the North, which was one of the first documentaries ever made. I think Nanook of the North is an extraordinary film. It was made in 1922 by Robert Flaherty, who's now seen as the father of documentary. The film captures the life of the Inuit people in the Canadian Arctic. It was filmed with a small crew, but huge cameras, which are all that were available at the time. And it was a completely novel way of making films. It was an attempt to record the everyday life of the Inuit people. But actually, every single shot had to be staged. For example, in this scene with the building of the igloo, they couldn't actually fit the camera through the door, so they had to build a special three-sided igloo just to accommodate the camera. Nowadays, that would provoke an enormous argument about whether or not that was lying. It's not lying, it's just what they had to do to bring that scene to life, to film it at all. But the fact is, for the first time, people were able to see real people doing real things, and that's what makes it magical. I feel rather unqualified to stand back and give an overview as to, for example, the importance of Nanook as the beginning of documentary. But I think that someone like A.A. A. Gill would be great to talk to. What's amazing about Nanook is that it invents a whole genre and it comes fully formed. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not a tentative move from fiction into fact. I mean, if you, you can look at a lot of, I don't know, Dickens and say, it's based in reality. It's based in the reality of Victorian London and it's based in the reality of his life, but it's all fiction. Yeah. But the Nuke of the North comes as an attempt to make, to show you other people's lives. That's immediately what documentary is. I think it's really interesting that Nanook is called Nanook and not the life of the Inuit people. I really love finding characters who will embody the issue. And in fact, the first film I made for television was called Home From The Hill, and it was a portrait of an old colonial, Colonel Hilary Hook, coming back from Kenya. I was staying out there, he was a friend of mine's father, and I'd just started the National Film School, and Hilary was asked to leave his house. And I took a gamble. My son Harry was out here, thank God, from England. And uh, Mugu gave us a faithful promise that he would um, leave me in peace till March. And then suddenly, a mad bull, he gives me five days to get out. Where you got to? Well, the trouble is, you see, they're only used to mud huts and they can get out of a mud hut in four days. Um, it's a right bugger. Well, I think Hilary Hook was a great character because he was so funny. But crucially, his situation was fascinating. 
if you do confidently follow a character and be patient don't push it too much don't tell them what to say or what to think but just see where the character's going you can end up with a very rich film almost because of the minute detail it's the grey areas it's the areas of behaviour tone of voice it's the fact that an audience begin to know somebody and then possibly feel more complex things about them God, by the right quick march in the company of men was shot in the early 90s in northern ireland big mortar in a gas jar you could lob it in there just like a whiz bang uh it's 100 kilograms of explosive and if we're in there when it when it hits it's good night vienna major crispin black was a company commander in the welsh guards serving in northern ireland and he was an absolute godsend he's standing outside rossley police station in county fermanagh pontificating in camouflage and explaining exactly what the job is. And he's a gift because of the way he talks, his turn of phrase, and there's an element of theatre about him. And as well as being engaging, he was open and honest with me about the task in hand. I think the worst thing is that underneath everybody realises they're conducting a fairly pointless task. But then you've got all sorts of people who aren't so good at being filmed or who arguably you shouldn't film because their predicament's tricky. And in fact, in the second of this army series, I'd been denied access to Crispin and they put me in an army patrol base where there was a young officer who was trying to cut his teeth with his platoon. You can lead through your rank. Uh, in other words, just enforce things through the authority of the system or you can lead through... Um, through uh, your your personality. And I just felt I was unfair in that film because I thought he was going through a very tricky situation and was too vulnerable, in a way, for me to film. Having said that, I know he doesn't like the film, but the MOD really loved the film because they thought it showed how very hard it is to be a young officer. Talking about casting, it's really worth drawing your attention to the famous series Seven Up, which was um, a magnificent television series done by Granada. It's actually beyond being a series. It's a sort of TV experiment because a group of children were found in 1964 and made a commitment to being filmed every seven years of their lives. And I think listening to Michael Apted talking about the casting of that series is absolutely fascinating. We picked from the extremes of society, which we later on sort of regretted, i.e. by that I mean we went to very wealthy schools in London. I think it's not a bad idea to pay for schools, because if we didn't, Schools would be so nasty and crowded. Then we went to poorer schools in the East End. Once I pulled his scarf and he said, don't you pull my scarf out there, can I eat him? And we went to Liverpool to get other than a southern accent in it. I hate her. She's always getting bad tempered and cross with me. Is she? Yeah. She says, Neil Hughes, move your desk forward. We went into the countryside. They like to come out for a holiday in the country when we like when I like to have a holiday in the town. We went to a, an orphanage and whatever. But nonetheless, you get the feeling that we were trying to prove something, that uh, the, socials, the social class structure still existed. And, you know, what happened, maybe I'm running ahead of myself, but what happened over the years, the whole idea of the film changed. The thrill of it is that what comes, if you focus on an individual or a couple of individuals, as opposed to looking making generalisations or looking at the big picture, you can end up getting the most extraordinary details that actually do take your film off into other areas and it becomes much more um, about life. I never show political events. I never tell you what's going on in England at the time. But it does come through, you know, because the politics in the film are those people. Their lives are the political statement of the film. You know, it isn't a rundown of what was happening when we made 35 up or 42 up. It's what these people say about their lives, in a sense, reflect the politics of the time. Do you make political films, Molly? 
Yes, I do make political films, but not overtly. The politics lies within the participants, the lies within the situation. And actually, your own politics are evident in how you select, how you shoot, to be frank, even the camera angle you choose, and then certainly how you put it together. Now, I wanted us to look at Paul Watson's 1985 film, The Fishing Party, which, as Peter Bazalgette explains here, was about more than a group of people fishing. 1985 was the middle of Thatcher's Britain. There was a real get-rich-quick idea in a rising market. People were making money in the city. There were lots of young men drinking champagne in bars. There was this feeling that it was soulless. And people who were left of centre were very alarmed by it. And they thought it was a really nasty, uncaring era. Paul Watson brilliantly caught the mood of that moment, caught the debate in Britain. By finding uh, three or four public school educated, quite rich, painfully unaware individuals. Oh dear, we missed. What a show. Corporal punishment must be, sorry, capital punishment, must be reintroduced as a deterrent. It must be. Uh, I, I think it is very, very important that this deterrent always exists, the deterrent of discipline and punishment. But if you do something wrong, you don't get told, oh, well, it's psychological or it's all because of your background or all because of your surroundings. You have done something wrong. The rules are very simple. Thou shalt not kill. I mean, how many... I don't know the facts. I don't know how many miscarriages of justice, how many men have gone to the gallows that shouldn't have. I think very, very, very few. After all, the death sentence is only passed when one is as certain as one can be, and it's never, ever 100%, but let's say 95% is good enough for me. In fact, probably in most cases, 90% is good enough for me. And I, I think the other thing is, the, the argument is who will hang him. I, think, I can think of a dozen people straight away who volunteer uh, to hang half these people. I don't, as far as hanging, in fact, probably I might even do it myself. It pushed? Yes, I think I would have no qualms about it whatsoever. And I think I genuinely feel if it ended up to be proven to be a mistake, well, it was a mistake. We all make mistakes in life. The Fishing Party became a very famous film and it was widely discussed. And its intentions are perfectly clear. I mean, if you take a group of rich people and show them shooting, in this case, seagulls, and edit it together with the soundtrack of the Tottenham riots breaking out on the radio, you are telling your audience what to think. And it's really interesting, in fact, all the things you can do, both in the shooting and the editing, to sort of emphasise a type or a point. So, for example, if you have a camera looking up at somebody and they're being interviewed and they've got an ancestral portrait behind them, you are saying something about them. And it's worth talking about those things because when you're watching a programme, you could be aware of how much your attitude to somebody is being coaxed. One of the characters from The Fishing Party, Guy Cheney, revisited the experience 20 years later in 40 Minutes On. My most intense sensation when watching this again and reflecting on it is one of um, anger. Um, and not anger with Paul Watson or the BBC, but anger with myself for actually doing it. Irrespective of whether we now hold the same views as those portrayed in the film, the great mistake was allowing ourselves to be filmed over a prolonged period and being totally relaxed and uninhibited in what we said and did in the extremely naive opinion that a documentary was being made about a fishing trip which would not be detrimental to us. I should imagine if there's a rule book that to be written for people who are getting involved in any form of documentary or filming, we broke every rule in the book. I think actually that they wrote to the BBC to ask them if they'd like to follow their fishing trip. And did that make them fair game? I think it makes them vulnerable. I think it's interesting also to see how different subjects obviously elicit completely different responses and attitudes from filmmakers. I mean, in, in as much as I think it's clear what Paul Watson felt, in creating the fishing party. I think it's equally clear what he's feeling in his portrait of Vanda in his wonderful film, Rain in My Heart. Are you prepared to let me hang around watching you, watching a bottle and seeing what happens? Because one of the rules will have to be, won't it, that I can't stop you. In a sense, I'm not there, but we all know I am. Yeah. 
and you will get drunk. How will you feel me being around you like that? Fine. Fine. So how are you? You look fabulous. Bandabado. You do look. You look terrific. But what's this? What's this? It's alcohol. Look. Do we haven't been in there seconds. And she was pulling out a bottle of vodka. Oh, silly girl. I'm not a girl. You're a woman. All I'm right. 43. So you're a woman. All right. I told you, it's not my job to stop you drinking, but I don't want to see you drinking that. No, OK. Well, can you just get out of my way, please? When Vanda okay. produced her... <sighs> rabbit out of a hat, her vodka. I just felt terrible. I just lost that remoteness that I have as a filmmaker, remoteness from... I get emotionally involved with people, but I manage to stand back and observe, and I get a lot of criticism for that. But if some of us don't record it, no one else will learn about it. I think it's so brilliant and honest that Paul puts himself in there and he's helping us watch something very difficult. Otherwise, we would simply judge the people in it. You would judge the woman that was being drunk. Whereas, in fact, you have a completely different way of judging her because Paul has taught you through and you know what you're going to see and he, as the filmmaker, is telling you. One of the filmmakers I really wanted to bring to this programme was Kim Longinotto because she makes films all over the world very much about women's issues or featuring women and their lives. And I think she opens the world up for a Western audience. I particularly wanted us to play a clip from her film Sisters-in-Law about two female judges in Cameroon. Listen, I don't want long stories of yes. a lightning so, flash so, not like in it 1940. Not 1940, ma'am. Just tell me, did you yes. go and marry this girl? So I went straight to the family. I took this 80,000 francs. They gave me a bid at... Uh, now that you have got a child, you should bring us a pig and some of those small, small things. You, but you know, this, your daughter has become a merchandise. The way you people play in the village, eh? the way you play with, with women and children, that's what makes her his wife. 80,000 francs and some pig. All right, madam, tell me what should I do to two of them? You don't want any case. I mean, what an extraordinary situation she puts us in, being over their shoulder, dealing with their daily lives and their problems. And that is one of the great things that documentary can do. I know why I make films about women. If men were shot in the head for going to school, at, at, or if men at 10 years old were married to 60-year-old women and forced to have sex with them and probably injured. If men were routinely beaten up by their wives and killed, you know, somewhere like Iran, I was particularly interested in Iran because Iranian people were being treated and, and revealed as fanatics, you know, it was during the time of Salman Rushdie, and we were thinking they were all ayatollahs and, and evil and, you know. I think by showing women, you can show people that you can really relate to. There are very few grounds on which a woman can get a divorce. One is her husband's inability to father a child. Massey has come with her sister to follow up her petition for divorce. Kim has an ability to be in a room and to record reality, but not to actually affect events, and that's a great skill of hers. You and I, we both know that you've been in situations where you're filming an event and you are, if, especially if you stay still and you're quiet, you're the least interesting thing in the, in the situation. If there's a, a row going on or if somebody's pleading for their life or, or somebody's slaughtering a cow and, it's, and they're upset. Or, Kim is talking about know, Molly's film, The Lie of the Land, which looked at animal rights against the backdrop of the hunting ban. What's wrong with that one? Nothing. There's no value for him because he's a he's um, a Guernsey cross. Like there's no trade in them at the moment. It's one of the sad things for the countryside. It would be exactly the same if you were there or not. It really would. The, the difference being, and I think it's what certainly with with the calf killing is that. The thing about being there with them is the anger, for example, that Paul from the Forbra felt. Mm -hmm. He articulates, because Which I'm gay. And so we go through the moment together. He can mm -hmm. see I'm shocked. 
Yeah. And indeed the camera wobbles because I'm shocked because yes. I didn't realise exactly what he was going to do. Mm-hmm. And I think that to me that's when it all fits in and, and it it's so it. worth... Yes. But what I'm trying to do in the way that I make films is that when you watch the film, the experience you have is very similar to the experience you have in a fiction film. What I mean is nothing's set up, of course, it's, it's all happening in front of your eyes, but what I want is for people to feel that they're in a situation watching it unfold. That's why I try and cut out as much as possible my voice, anything to do with me. But at the same time, I think this idea of rules, it's quite interesting because if somebody... I don't say to people, don't look at the camera or don't talk to me, which is a very old-fashioned way that observational was meant to work yeah you know don't pretend i'm not here in that horrible expression fly on the wall i love it when people talk to me and for example if you're alone in a room with somebody and something's happened they're going to maybe say something to you you know there was a a scene in a film i did where a woman's clearing up blood because this has been a murder and she's saying oh he's probably got quite good blood clotting capabilities and she's talking aloud and she's feeling relaxed enough to do that. It's not an interview, but it's kind of a discussion with one person. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And I like that freedom. I like the fact that we can just take what rules we want. This series reveals what life is really like in a modern secondary school. All the patients you're about to see were treated in just one 24-hour period. Hello, darling. Here, the hardest to treat pets from across Britain. This is no ordinary restaurant. Oh, my God. There are so many different ways to make a documentary these days, particularly because of developments in technology, um, to the point that now the filmmaker doesn't even have to be in the room. So one of the people I wanted to speak to was the producer Jonathan Stadlin, who makes the Channel 5 series, GPs Behind Closed Doors, which shows the reality of day-to-day life in a GP's surgery. How long have you been breathing this fast for? Today and yesterday. I think we're probably going to need to send you in because we're not winning. You're at that point now where potentially you could get so exhausted that you'd find it hard to breathe at all. You're going to get reception to call an ambulance, all right. Just going to have the door open, just in case you need us. Relief in one sense, when the door closes and the patient's gone with the ambulance crew, they're safe, they're going to hospital, that's what needs to happen. Um, sometimes a sense of kind of, not anti-climax, but almost, because you've had this adrenaline, everyone's been rushing around, we've looked off the patients the, the best of our ability and now they're in someone else's care. But actually, you then have to take a deep breath and realise that probably you're running late because this has taken, understandably, way more than 10 minutes, potentially 20, 30, 40 minutes. So then you kind of take a deep breath and have to face the day explaining to everyone. Hopefully, most patients understand, but it can be quite stressful then. My old boss used to say, you want three things in a programme as a viewer. You want to sit there and go, um, I wish that was me, that is me, or thank God that's not me. And if, <laughs> if a programme's got a bit of all of that, you're doing quite well. And I think, I think GPs definitely, that, that show definitely has that. You, 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 you sit there thinking, what would I do and what if that was me? Mm. Jonathan, would you define rig for me? So a fixed rig camera setup is different to having uh, a single person or two or three people with cameras in a room. We have fixed rig cameras, which are cameras screwed into the wall that are remotely operated, so there's no one in the room, and the, the cameras are controlled by people sitting in a gallery somewhere else in the building. We just film what happens and we can't intervene. We can't say, could you say that again? We can't say, could you just look that way or can we frame it like this? We're just saying, we're going to film what happens as if we're not there. How does it work? I mean, how does the rig actually work? So there are 36 cameras in the surgery, four in four cameras in six rooms, and they all come back to one central gallery, which looks like Big Brother. But we have to have a dedicated team of four specially trained people sitting in the waiting room, telling every single patient that comes in, by the way, we're filming a documentary here, have you seen this programme? This is how it works. And then they have to sign a release form before they go in. And then we have to ring them afterwards if we want to include them in the edit under the Ofcom rules, we have to ring them a second time and say, just so you know, is that okay that we include it in it? Um, and the doctors get a viewing of it. So it's a really massive logistical undertaking and that's 50 episodes of that series now. The interesting thing for me is what happens with the doctors because we filmed there for 35 weeks. So every day for 35 weeks, it's nine months or something. Mm. When the doctors came into their room, 
they did sometimes forget that the camera was there. And then we got really, really honest portrayal of what it's like to be a doctor. What's it, what I wanted to do is, what's it like to have the door open 18 times in a session and someone walks in and says, I've got an ingrown toenail and then in, you've got to deal with that in 10 minutes. And then the next patient comes in and she says, I want to kill myself and I think I'm going to do it this evening. Yeah. And you have 10 minutes to try and deal with that. And I think we've told that story really honestly. I think you definitely get that sense of the unexpected. You do not know what's going to happen next. Would there ever have been an argument for doing a GP surgery with a single camera? Well, interestingly, I've done both. So when we first started this project, I went and filmed lots of doctors saying, yes, we want to take part. Yes, you can come and film our things. And no channel believed that we would get the patient saying yes. So I went into the waiting room and asked people in the waiting room, would you mind if I just filmed your appointment? And most people said no, because they thought I was some sort of dodgy sex pest. And then a few people said yes. And then when I actually was waiting for them in the room with a camera, they absolutely changed their mind. They feel nervous having a second person in the room, but they don't think that by having a small remote camera, there's millions of people in the room with them. I think it's brilliant, this access to life, until it got to the man with cancer and the doctor leaves the room and we're just looking at him. And I felt just incredibly voyeuristic because there was no filter. Mm. And it was a kind of incredibly intense and intimate moment that I wasn't completely sure um, was, was right. It's technically possible. Then it made me think maybe people shouldn't forget them. What you most definitely tried to do is you had to work very hard with building a relationship with people to get them to trust you so they would open up. And what's happened with Riggs is that we don't need to do that because people go in and they are oblivious often to the camera. They forget that the camera is there very quickly. Now, what we're both trying to do is we're trying to tell a human story and we're trying to tell the story of a human condition uh, in the most honest way. And there's no right way of doing that. And I do think that actually people have a filter. If you sit with someone in a waiting room and you say, by the way, when you go into your consultation, you're going to be filmed, there will be cameras in the room. I think 99% of people will A, remember that there is a camera there, and B, they do react slightly differently. This programme is called The Camera Never Lies, but can the microphone lie better than the camera? We're not actually in a cafe. I've just added some sound effects underneath to make this sound a bit more lively. Now, clearly that's deception. But as award-winning radio producer Simon Elms explains, sometimes with sound effects, it's a matter of balance. Often you want to have as much discrete sound as you can that is to say if you want to if you're recording somebody in a car you record it, the person with the microphone as close to the mouth of the speaker as possible to eliminate as much of the background noise as you can because clarity and uh, communicability is is number one priority as far as radio is concerned you have to be able to hear what somebody's saying if then you feel that the car is not present enough, you don't get enough of the sense that we're in a car, it would be, in my book, completely legitimate to add some additional car recording sounds from the same vehicle recorded at the same time to, as it were, thicken up the effects. So that it's, it's a matter of control. We do this as a way of enhancing the moment. We're not telling a lie, we're just enhancing the experience, compressing it, giving the listener a chance to feel what it was like actually to be riding in that car with somebody. We're trying to reconstruct a reality that the microphone hadn't quite captured, and that, that's legitimate. Now, quite often with radio documentaries, the presenter doesn't conduct all the interviews in person. So I could edit Molly's voice to make it sound like she was in the same room as Simon, but that wouldn't be accurate. Editing is a process of refinement and selection. It inevitably means cutting sections of a long interview. Um, sometimes a feature interview is as long as 45 minutes, an hour, possibly even longer. I once interviewed somebody for um, something like four hours, four or five hours in the course of a day, which was a programme called Survivors, which was broadcast in the early 1990s, so we're going back a long way now. And uh, the character involved was a young woman called Wendy, who um, had been held up at gunpoint in California, and uh, when while she was taking a bath, 
and she uh, was subjected to a terrible torture and indeed rape by the young man who was uh, holding her up, but for whom in the end, who'd, who'd had a dreadful life, she discovered, and whom she parlayed for about eight hours himself, and um, felt very sympathetic and empathetic to his situation, despite the terrible ordeal that Wendy had been through. Now, Wendy spoke much as I'm doing so now, i.e. with long, reflective pauses between her sentences. And when I edited the material, I thought what is key to preserving the reflective nature of Wendy's contribution, her very thoughtful and very humane uh, response to this dreadful, dreadful crime, part of that was very much to reflect her thoughtfulness and therefore the pauses within, within her speech. He asked me whether anyone lived in the other bedroom, and I said no. I felt I had to be honest with him. It seems crazy. I think that he was an extremely frightened, desperate kid who... I mean, I, don't, I think no one had ever spoken to him like a human being before. But the pauses were far too long for broadcast. In, in practical terms, I couldn't leave the sorts of pauses she was leaving. So I, of course, speeded her up. I cut out some of the pauses and reduced the very, very long pauses to a more manageable length. I think, listening to an extract from that programme now, I think I'd le have left the pauses longer now. Uh, I think I slightly overspeeded her up. It was the controller of BBC One, Peter Fincham, who told journalists at the channel's autumn launch that the Queen had walked off in a huff after being asked by the photographer to remove her crown. Footage from the documentary appeared to show this, but in fact it had been assembled in the wrong order by the production company. Last night, Mr Fincham apologised and said he took full responsibility, but that's unlikely to draw a line under the incident. The BBC Trust has asked the Director-General, Mark Thompson, to give it a full account of events. The scrutiny that was attracted to that apparent mis-editing for effect of a, a piece of promotional film certainly sent a, a, an electric shock through the BBC uh, because we thought, hang on a minute, what can we do? We all edit programmes. Edit, editing is a con constituent part of how you make programmes fit the time slots, how we can corral our material, shape it and turn it into programmes. The very fact that people were shocked, that shots were cut together out of order and things weren't necessarily put together exactly as they were shot made me realise how little people know about how documentary or news or current affairs is put together. As in you're trying to construct something that's going to make sense to people and very often you do have to move the order of things around. How long do you film for? In a way, it's not how long I film for, it's how much do I shoot. And I think, to be honest, I do shoot quite a lot. And the reason I shoot a lot of footage is because it's me and I'm gambling all the time. I've got my character, but I'm going to follow every possible tangent because it might be putting flesh on the bone. And the person who receives this pile of footage is the editor. The editor is crucial. You need intense discipline in the cutting room because essentially that's where you're creating your script. And I worked for many years with a really wonderful editor called Ted Roberts, and he cut the ARC series for me. And Ted Roberts talked about working with you on the ARC in this clip from the BFI box set edition of your films. I do employ a kind of musical rhythm sometimes in, in, in cutting, uh, and it even goes as far as choosing which syllable of, of, a, of a piece of dialogue to cut away on and that sort of thing, whether it should be a dominant cut or a less dominant cut to, to make it flow more easily. There's all sorts of things like that that um, I probably do just instinctively. Can I just say, please, please bring to an end all negotiations we are conducting? I think 
an absolute masterpiece, beautifully, beautifully cut. It's a meeting when people are protesting about the closure of the zoo intercut with animal movements. Mm, mm. And it's incredible. And I watched mm. some of it yesterday and you've built up the pace of it. So by the Clinton time this Keely, man that, is shouting, yes. you must have a plan. Yes. There's a caracal lynx being chased around yes. a cage. And the whole thing is building and you're feeling it because as the people start to shout and the meeting's falling apart, the animal movements are more frenzied. Friend, frenzied and it's quite horrible to watch, yes. <laughs> they sort of uh, cut to the goose being uh, trapped on the end of dialogue as, as the uh, clapping start. I am horrified by the negative noises coming from this floor. The first reality that is not being grasped here is that Britain is the only country in the developed world where a national zoo is expected to be self-financing. It sort of um, signposts the language of the next few minutes. There's an acceleration in, in, um, in rhythms throughout the, the sequence, which I think is quite satisfying. I think you are a co-writer with with the um, with the director um, I've always thought that I am contributing however small a way to an endearing literature and a sort of a, a um, series of small short stories if you like which hopefully will be available for people to look at down the generation dawn freshened the climb is done down towards Glasgow, she descends. Towards the steam tugs, yelping down the glade of cranes. Towards the fields of apparatus, the furnaces, set on the dark plain like gigantic chessmen. All Scotland waits for her. In the dark glens, beside the pale green... If you study documentary at film school, you can be absolutely certain that you're going to be shown night mail. And also you're going to be taught about John Grierson. Grierson actually defined documentary as the creative treatment of actuality and he ran the GPO film unit for which he made this wonderful film, Night Mail. I wish we'd go back to the, you know, the GPO film unit and the British film documentary makers and, and Grierson. The Night Mail is, I mean, that, that breaks almost every convention of documentary and yet is plainly a documentary, is plainly a profound truth about so much more than a railway and letters. And it has a script that's written by W. H. Auden as a poet. It has, which is recited by another poet, by John Betjamin, edited by an artist, William Colston with music by Benjamin Britten. This is the night mail crossing the border, bringing the cheque and the postal order, letters for the rich, letters for the poor, the shop at the corner of the girl next door, pulling up B took a steady climb, the gradients against her, but she's on time. I mean, none of those people would you think of as being archetypal documentary makers. But it is, it's a, Great, great, great documentary. Past cotton grass and moorland boulder, shoveling white steam over her shoulder, snorting noisily as she passes, silent miles of wind bent grasses, birds turn their heads as she. I think that it's really down. important She's to recognise in this programme because we're talking primarily about filming characters and real people and them telling the story. But actually, the bulk of factual television is commentary led. And very often it's an authoritative thesis, whether it's Simon Sharma or Norma Percy, it's people who are telling us what is happening in our world. And I wanted to speak to A.A. Gill for this programme, particularly because his father made civilization. Dorothy Wordsworth said about the view of London from Westminster Bridge that it was like one of nature's own grand spectacles. Well, nature is violent and brutal, 
and there's nothing we can do about it. Look, I found this in a junk shop. And this is the end of civilization. The it, end of okay. civilization. This is the last bit of civilization. Someone has got an inscribed. It was Kenneth Clark's final summation of what civilization meant. And they've made it look like something out of the Bible. Go on, be pompous, read it to us, because it's going to be hard on radio. I can't do his voice, but it was, I believe in courtesy, the ritual by which we avoid hurting other people. By satisfying our own egos. And I think we should remember that we are part of a great whole, which, for convenience, we call nature. All living things are our brothers and sisters. Above all, I believe in the God-given genius of certain individuals. And I value a society that makes their existence possible. Would that happen now? A seri I mean, you Well, know. they are making civilization again, exactly. Are they? Yeah. No, no, I mean, civilization... And, and interestingly, the, the remake of civilization is in the sign of the, the times is being made now with three presenters as opposed to one, so it's not a single view of culture. It's not a sort of paternalistic authority. It's three possibly conflicting opinions. And nobody questioned the idea that you would have a series called Civilization without qualification. Mm. And it would just be about Europe. <laughs> <laughs> How sophisticated are people about being filmed? I think people are incredibly sophisticated now. The fact that everybody's filming, everybody's got a camera and it never stops has actually made the territory very blurred. You made a portrait about a woman very used to being filmed, Jerry Halliwell. She was at the time going through a bit of a trauma with the Spice Girls and she then ran away from the Spice Girls and while she was in hiding she phoned me up and said, would you make a film about me? I've already started, but would you carry it on? I mean, it was a difficult, it was a tussle for power because actually she was already making a film about herself. I've got complete control on it and it'll be edited if there's anything, you know, bad in it or, you know, then when it's really serious, we just, they will leave the room. Okay? Uh, okay. Sorry, but I was just listening to you then and what you just said to him about this film being totally in your control. And I'm sitting here thinking, no, it's not. It is, though. I don't like it. But I'm not going to spend months following you round for then you on a whim to say, no, I don't like it. You see what I mean? That's what I meant. You either hand over a bit to me or I can't do it. Yeah. I'm not that egotistical. I think, oh, you know, this is just about me. But then on the other hand, as, you know, my managing myself, this has to a degree, you know, of course I don't... What's the point of making a film to destroy my public image? Do you know what I mean? and the initial idea that she was going to make a documentary on all of us. And what happened was that I, subs I left the band and I, I really liked her kind of way and she was very, I could tell that she was very, how do you say, nitty gritty and very real. And there was no way that the Spice Girls as a band were going to let such a hardcore documentary maker come that close. It just wasn't going to happen. But it kind of suited me. <laughs> I always thought I was a bit lonely at the time. The reason I'd gone to meet the Spice Girls and met Jerry was because I was particularly interested in making a film about somebody famous. I'd had this extraordinary experience of doing Tony Blair's party election broadcast in 1997. Homework? We have a lot of that under Labour. <laughs> you, wait, you wait till David Blanket gets hold of you. He'll be doing a lot of homework. <laughs> the kids, they, they keep you grounded because you're seeing all through them and through their friends of what's actually happening. I was thinking I wanted you to <laughs> burst into song. I thought it was going to be quite an easy film to make. It was short, it was for a specific purpose, but we had huge problems with access. I was never in the same room as Tony. But then we had a breakthrough when we were finally allowed into his house and into the kitchen. I mean, I, 
I suppose when I was at university, I... So tell you what, say it and don't be careful. And I promise you, I mean, it's yours. Yeah, I know, I know. So I mean, I suppose what happened was at university... I mean, for the first time, I started to think about things a bit, a bit more. I started to... I, I, I saw for the first time the connection between the type of... <laughs> <laughs> He was just very nice and very natural. I mean, I'm not saying anything political here. I'm, so, I'm just saying, as a human being, he was great and that worked filming him there. And I thought how he was with his children was very attractive and I thought this is where the film should be made. I think sometimes my interest in or desire to uh, find out about bits of life can lead me to do things that possibly you should stand back and think, hang on, looking at the big picture, should I be making a party election broadcast? The access to being inside a world, what I learnt from being inside that bubble of new labour when it was beginning, was so extraordinary. To be self-critical, I think you need to think quite carefully about using documentary to sell people or things just as a point of principle. Do you think you were being used as a filmmaker in, in this particular situation? Of course. Of course I was being used and I was allowing myself to be used. I think you are interested in people's relations with one another. Yes. But does that make me wrong to do a party political broadcast? No, it doesn't make you wrong at all. But it is if I work with people who are scared of truth because they think that truth is going to drop them in it rather than my belief that yeah. truth well out, and truth is what you should celebrate about things. Yeah, that's true, but on the other hand, you can't expect politicians to be perfect, you know. Do you find with the people you film that there is a camera consciousness and a self-awareness? I'm asking because of the way the places you film and the sort of people um, you film. I, it's very different in, in each film. I made a film in 2003 called The Day I Will Never Forget, and I filmed a women's meeting um, about FGM, the film's about female genital mutilation. There was a very dramatic meeting and her mother was saying, we have to do it to the children. I didn't know it was her mother. We have to do it to our daughters. There was this little girl sitting, listening to this whole debate. And at the end, she grabbed hold of me and said, you have to come to my house. And I, I said, oh, Fazia, we're tired. The sound recorders was feeling a bit fed up, you know. And she said, please come, I've been waiting for you. When I got to her house, she said, stand over there. She told me where to stand. And then she told me this poem that she'd written when she was being mutilated, after it, when she was recovering, right into the camera. I want to tell you a poem entitled The Day I Will Never Forget. It was on a Sunday night when my mum called me and she said, my daughter, come in a low voice. I went quietly. Suddenly, my mum said, my daughter, tomorrow is your D-Day. I was shocked to hear that, but I was not expected to say anything. In the morning... And then she and went and sat with her mother and told her mother what she'd felt when it happened and why did she do it and she, that, she, that it was so painful and she didn't have to do that. And, she, and then at the end of it, she said, I'll forgive you if you don't do it to my, do my sister, Pardosa, who's three. And the, well, afterwards, I looked at her poem, and in the poem she'd written when she was recovering, and she wrote it in English, it said, um, I'm asking you, my loving parents, is this what I really deserve? That was the end of it. When she told it into the camera, it says, I'm asking my loving parents, is this what I really deserve? I'm asking all of you... Is this what I really deserve? And when you watch it on the cinema, it's actually her talking into your eyes because she's looking into the camera. <clears throat> and she knew what she was doing, and she was seven. Crikey. That's I know, amazing. it is crikey. Yeah. And she'd watched very little TV. She lived in Nairobi. She hadn't never been filmed before. She'd never seen a film. And yet she knew this was her chance to get her poem out and to get her... to make this incredible sense of injustice she'd had. Is this really what I deserve? She wanted to say that to an audience and she used me to do it. Sula is just one of four young Shetland ponies that Frank and his wife Jem are taking to the biggest pony auction of the year in Lerwick, a three hour journey away. 
But the documentaries we're watching are so set up and so stiff and so manipulated. I mean, manipulated isn't even the right word. I was the the thing I really hated was when people I was being told what people were thinking because I I just thought you don't know what this person's thinking. You're imagining it. How dare you do that? You don't do that in fiction. You don't have Tony Soprano's very fed up because he's just murdered someone and it's happened again or something like that. But I, I think it's important for us to have these conversations because what I'm constantly amazed by is that TV critics just talk about what the film's about or they... There was a couple of films I've seen recently that TV critics said gave it five stars and you watch it and you can't believe that they don't mention any the music over constant over everything and then drowning out the the drama sometimes you know because what little drama there is and the commentary they never mention that like in her previous house on the neighboring island of fetler mother mary has chosen her spare room to become her sanctuary and chapel as far as I've got with the chapel... And also, the there's an air of desperation the about the music, the degree of manipulation. And you know the one, I think it was Keeping Up With The Khans, there was a fantastic sequence with Omar, who was an asylum seeker. Mm -hmm. Some of that and was the voice, great. The material was great yes. and buried in format. But what? do you remember that bit of voiceover when it actually said, in a slightly mocking way, something referring to Omar maybe wanting his pot of gold? Yes. I thought that's really shocking, that you're actually going to lend that degree of subjectivity to this voiceover. This is Keeping Up With The Khans, which is made by Love Productions for Channel 4. Omar's pot of gold consists of £35 a week and a single bed. To keep these benefits, he has to sign on at the home office in person every two weeks. Old hand Hyder has offered to show him the ropes. Oh my God. I'm going to take a photo of this, huh? But progress through town is slow when there is a new marvel to discover on every street. This supermarket, post office, anything from here, 99 p. Anything? Anything. Sure. Huh? I want to take you here to refugee center and home office. Oh, it's nice, huh? I don't like. It's almost like what they would have at the beginning of The Sopranos would be a voiceover saying, there's 350 mafia in New Jersey, Tony Soprano is one of them. And then at the, at, after the break, you have a recap. Charlie's been very upset. He's looking forward to seeing his mother tomorrow. Then the mother comes in. Charlie's mother's very angry. I, mean, I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but they think that the audience is so stupid that after a break of, of um, adverts for two minutes, they're going to have forgotten what they've just seen, that, you know, and they're going to need to be told what they've just seen. And also they've got such short memories or, or attention spans that if you don't keep promising these dramatic events that are going to happen, they're going to not watch. Hmm. So it's constantly telling you you're going to see something very good. So you get the most dramatic scene at the beginning, a bit of it. So when it comes, you think, oh, I saw that. Didn't I see that at the beginning? What's that? You know, so... That, and, and yet, fiction films are getting longer and longer, and people can sit through long films. That's what I want from documentary, just that, that you're being, you're being allowed to find out things for yourself, you're, you're in the room with the people, you're living through an experience, and you're not being, you know, chivied along and, and jostled by this, this commentary. The first thing you must always ask about all documentaries is, why was this made? What was the belief, the feeling, the motivation, the money given to make this. There is an enormous amount of documentary made which are count as documentary production when they go at the end of the year we've made 150 hours of documentary but they also include things like first dates and they all they all are what what do they call them enhanced reality which is it's like fake truth. I mean, it's oxymoronic. A, they're cheap to make. That's the first thing you must see. You look at it and go, how much did this cost to make? Mm. Next to nothing. There seems to be, or they assume there is, an endless fascination, which I think is like Victorian circuses. 
is like people watching two-headed calves and mm. and bearded women and people you wouldn't stare at on the tube because you'd be embarrassed. Yes. You can stare at them in your living room because you know they can't see you back. Uh-huh. When documentary is made to catch people out, to shame people, to make them look fools, to ridicule their beliefs, however much I may agree with the, the stance of the filmmaker, I am uncomfortable because I am being used as a way, as a, as a means of beating somebody, humiliating them, um, exposing them, judging them. I am being used as, as the audience, I am an integral part of the judicial process of this film, which I have, to, I have no say in. I, just by watching it, I am being used to humiliate someone, and I find that uncomfortable. I have to say, I think the upside is that there's never been more documentary or more factual television than there is at the moment, and indeed documentaries in cinema, which is thrilling. There are an awful lot of people to celebrate. Adam Curtis making films like Bitter Lake. This is a film about why those stories have stopped making sense and how that led us in the West to become a dangerous and destructive force in the world. It is told through the prism of a country at the centre of the world, Afghanistan. So, in quite an authoritative way, he is telling us about Afghanistan, and he's illustrating it in the most creative way you can imagine. We have Nick Fraser at BBC continuing to push documentary in Storyville, but I do think it's an uphill struggle increasingly for good documentary filmmakers to be trusted and to be funded to get out there and tell their stories, and I think that we should be wary of. Without being too pompous, but bearing in mind you need a conclusion, as do all good films, that it's sort of a democratic right that we should have documentaries that reflect our worlds back to us and that they don't all become just entertainment. 